I'm I'm thank I'm thankful for I'm thankful for I'm thankful for I I I can't I don't know how yet. I think for I'm really thankful for um and thank you and thank you for food. Spaghetti. The spaghetti. Yes. I like the book. I like the well sometimes they call them chickens. Probably cheesecake. I said chewy. Orange juice. I think meat. I like to eat donuts. I'm thinking about it. Hmm. I got it. I'm thankful for my family. Uh, mommy, daddy, Meredith. And I'm thankful for, for, for my, for my four siblings. I'm thankful for my brothers and sisters. I'm thankful for my sisters. My mama and and Jesus and. God. That's all I can think of. And by the way, my Aunt Kathy is actually my dad's sister. I'm thankful for my dog. I'm thankful for, for puppies. I'm thankful for when I go to the zoo. I'm thankful for Winnie the Pooh. A lion. A lion. Tigers. They say rats. Mm-hmm. And monkeys. I don't forgot. I forgot. Dad, you say it. Cobble, cobble. <laughs> cobble. Cobble, cobble. Cobble, cobble. Oh, I did it. I mean, I'm... I'm party. Oh yes. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm done now. Good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Mark Hensley. I'm speaking from the pulpit here at the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church in Colorado Springs. Thank you for tuning in today. Uh, do let us know where you're from, how we can pray for you, and then share this with your friends. That's how you partner with us in sharing the gospel. But I'm glad you're watching. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this Thanksgiving season. I thank you that we have so much to be thankful for. In you, we live and move and have our being. We are who we are by the grace of God. Thank you, Father, for creating this world through your Son. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to rescue everyone who would believe. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being our comforter and our down payment of our eternal life in Jesus. And Lord, I pray your comfort on everyone watching, your direction. We pray for the release of the hostages in Haiti. We pray for a turning of hearts and minds to you throughout the United States, throughout the world. And we pray with the early church, even so come, Lord Jesus. Guide our time together today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before you know it, you'll be doing some Christmas shopping, and you may do most of yours online. That's so convenient. Or you may brave the mall. And of course, here in this city, we have um, a lot of places to shop. When I was pastoring in Wyoming, uh, they certainly had places to shop, but it was not too similar to here. In fact, I remember once looking for presents for my family uh, and for Laura specifically, and I was at the Rock Springs Mall in Rock Springs, Wyoming. Now, when you hear that, don't think Chapel Hills. <laughs> when you hear that, don't think Citadel Mall. The mall there is, is nice and it has a number of stores, but it's limited. In fact, the food court has one choice. I will have a pretzel, please. <laughs> That's all you got. But I remember walking uh, through that mall about this time of year and a little girl uh, was walking in front of me and she didn't know I was behind her. 
and she spontaneously started to sing. And I vividly remember the lyrics to her song. Where's my daddy? Where's my daddy? Where's my daddy? Where's my daddy? And I just thought that was so humorous. I must have laughed out loud because she looked back and saw me. And she immediately rewrote her lyric. And this is what she started to sing in the mall in Rock Springs, Wyoming. That's not my daddy. That's not my daddy. That's not my daddy. That's my, not my daddy. And I just thought that was hilarious. And I was laughing. And then pretty soon her dad walked up and she saw him and changed that song for the third time, rewriting the lyrics on the fly and started to sing, that's my daddy, that's my daddy, that's my daddy, that's my daddy. I'll never forget that walk through the mall in Wyoming with that little girl. And her song reminded me of something. She knew who her father was. And when she saw him, her heart burst with joy and recognition. I wonder sometimes, when people of this world look at your life and my life through the different hues and colors of a lifetime, the challenges, the uphill battles, the times of celebration, the times of rejection, the times of depression, and everything in between, do they see our Father in us? Do they see the resemblance? Does our life so reflect the love of God in Christ that it reflects on the people around us and inspires them to believe that he can lead them too? Today, we continue a series called God Can, and so he can. When you find yourself in an in-between place, between perhaps despair and hope, between a, an old experience and a new beginning, God really can take care of you in the in-between times. The prophet Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17, 8 through 15, will have an interesting encounter with a widow and her son. And the story from long ago is a vivid reminder that in the now, God can get you where he wants you to go in just, at just the right time. So be finding the book of 1 Kings chapter 17, 8 through 16, under that title, in the in-between times, you'll notice the Lord God can take care of you. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose, went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a woman was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare for myself and my son that we might eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go, and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it, bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. In the in-between times, God really can take care of you because he wants to guide your life. In the in-between times, God really can <clears throat> and will <clears throat> pardon me, take care of you because we are provided for by the Lord. And in the in-between times, God really can take care of you and will because we're all so comforted by the Lord. So notice, first of all, we are guided by the Lord. 1 Kings 17 is a fascinating chapter. Just prior to that, we're introduced to a wicked king named Ahab. So wicked that he was more wicked than all the kings that preceded him. 
First thing he did was build an Asherah pole and begin worshiping Baal. And then the second thing he did was marry Jezebel, a godless woman, uh, the daughter of Ethbaal. We'll talk about him in a moment. And she just wanted pagan worship to take over Judah and Israel. And Ahab has been sent to talk to Ahab. Excuse me, Elijah has been sent to talk to Ahab. And this is what he says to him. It's not going to rain anymore for three years or whenever I say it's supposed to, meaning I represent God. God's bringing a famine to this desecrated land that you have become in charge of. And then immediately God tells Elijah, you need to get out of Dodge. And so he does. He travels to the brook Cherith. Remember, Judah, Israel, that part of the Middle East is in a drought now dictated by God. And God takes care of Elijah. He sends him to the brook Cherith. And there he has water. But of course, water alone doesn't sustain a human being. So God, the Bible says, in the first part of 1 Kings that we didn't actually read, says to the ravens, he commands the ravens to feed him. Someone said that's the first time they had airline food in the world. <laughs> and they start bringing sustenance and food to Elijah. He has water, he has food. But what happens, and it happens to all of us, is God has us for a season and a reason and a place, and then he decides to relocate us. He has that right because he owns us. The Bible says we are bought with a price. And as one pastor said so eloquently, it was the rich red ruby royal blood of Jesus Christ, the ruby red royal blood of Jesus. So he's going to send Elijah on a new assignment. I love what my favorite seminary professor, J.W. McGorman, used to say. He said, it's never the servant's prerogative to tell the master what he will do. So the brook dries up and God comes to Elijah. God never closes the door without opening a window and he gives him his marching orders. He basically says this, and I promise you it must have stunned him. I have commanded a woman in Zarephath, a widow, to take care of you. That's an unlikely provision. And so head that way, prano. Well, he does what God says, and I often tell people two words that will change. The direction of your life are the words, yes, Lord. And if you think about it, folks, life is never static. It can seem that way sometimes, but it's fluid. Something's coming into your life, perhaps someone into your life. And that's something or that someone can change the direction of your life. Elijah is a man from the other side of the tracks who's about to soon face the fury of Jezebel and Ahab and a showdown on Mount Carmel. He's going to face ruthless Jezebel. And he's going to realize that serving God and following God is the most wonderful of decisions, even when there are others who want to extinguish your life. Elisha's been cared for in an obscure place by a brook, a source of water that's desolate, in a land that was devastated by drought. The spiritual climate of Israel, you must understand, was just as dismal, and God was about to change that. And so here is God saying, I want you to go to Serapith. Actually, he's going to a land that we know today as modern-day Lebanon. It's more than 100 miles from the safety and the seclusion of the brook Cherith. And with each step he walks, he knows he's the most wanted man in the, in the whole land. Public enemy number one. What you'll find very interesting is when God tells him to go to Zarephath, that's in Sidon, which was under the domain and the far-reaching terror of Ethbael. Don't you remember? That's Jezebel's dad. And if anyone could take out Elijah, it would be the king of Sidon, or the king of Tyre, I should say, Ethbael. So here is Elijah <laughs> under God's orders, under sealed orders, knowing that with each step I'm getting closer and closer to danger and people who want to take my life 
out. He had, as one writer put it, to elude assassins working for Jezebel, hiding during the daylight hours, traveling under the cover of darkness, always, always looking over his shoulder. And it reminds us of what it says in the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 16. Look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. I liked what Dave Roper said about this. He said, God may indeed set us down in a perilous place or perilous neighborhoods or offices or classrooms. Elijah, the Bible says in the New Testament, was a man like us. And so like us, he had his challenges. And this one was a big one. You notice God's new direction often will lead to a crisis of belief. The crisis of belief happens when we have a clear direction from God and we begin to wonder, can I do this? Is this something within my purview? We can't fathom how we can accomplish a task. We feel God's imprint and direction, but we're overwhelmed by the challenge. We feel ill equipped for the mission. You ever felt that way? We don't think we'll enjoy the job. We can't make financial sense out of the request. We have a million reasons why I'd rather not go. All of our excuses and all of our doubts, all of our reasons, all that hinders us from following and obeying the God of life, who's leading our life, says things like this. We do not believe he can accomplish his work through us. I mean, despondency, as Alexander McLaren said, the Scottish preacher has a knack of picking its facts. And we get into a rut of terrible thinking. We don't believe he's able to equip us. We don't believe there will be joy found in the service. We don't believe he will provide. That's why Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Wouldn't it be amazing if one day someone picked up this book and actually did what it said? But sometimes we're hesitant because we have planned our own life's journey without his counsel best thing we can do best thing i would tell you if i could start my life over if i had a thousand lifetimes i'd give every one of them to jesus by the way i told my wife laura today if i had a thousand lifetimes i'd spend every one courting her and asking her to marry me but the best thing you can do folks is just take out a blank sheet of paper sign your name at the bottom and say god fill in the details now listen i don't know where you're at right now i may know where you are geographically but I don't know where you are emotionally, financially, or spiritually. But the Lord does. I mean, he made us that way. He made us physical beings, spiritual beings, emotional beings. And wherever you are in the now, you are on God's radar. Sometimes this is what we think. I'm insignificant. I'm not that important. I'm just one of 7.8 billion people on the earth. Does he really care about me? Well, folks, the Bible says a sparrow doesn't fall without his awareness of it. The Bible says he numbers the hairs of our very head. And for some of us, that's not a big deal. <laughs> it's not a lot of calculating. But I want to assure you that wherever you are, the Lord knows that. And just as he took an ancient prophet 3,000 years ago, from the relative safety and obscurity of the brook Cherith to Sidon and the territory of Jezebel's daddy, he knows how to protect you <clears throat> through the different and difficult and obtuse and frightening chapters of life. I want to encourage you so much from this text that God can orchestrate and plot and navigate and plan and put together people and places at just the right juncture to guide you in a brand new direction. The Bible teaches emphatically that when we cast our care upon him, he, it's because he cares for us. He loves you as much as he loved Elijah. And in fact, Elijah was saved because he was looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. You and I as believers in Christ are saved because we've looked to Jesus and he's adopted us into his family. We are heirs and joint heirs of God in Christ. And the God who led Elijah will lead you. 
just trust him when it's a little bit frightening. Just take another step. Faith footing can sometimes seem shaky. But listen to me, it's not a leap into the dark. If it's a leap into the dark, it's a leap in the dark onto a rock. And the rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. I, I think about this. I wonder if there wasn't more of an exchange in the arise and the actual arising <laughs> and arrival. He will trudge a hundred miles through dangerous territory in a land, for the most part, devoid of trees. There's not much places to hide. And Elijah was public enemy number one. But remember this, if God be for you, who can be against you? Remember this, folks, you and God is a majority, no matter what it may seem like. You can have all the forces of hell arrayed against you. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Trust him. Rest in him. Hope in him. Believe in him. And watch what he will do. Because we notice that we are provided for by the Lord. Do you see it? So he gets to the gate of the city. Behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. God had already provided for Elijah through a lady he hadn't even met yet. And he calls to her and he asks for water. Well, that's an easy enough request to fulfill. Water was uh, certainly scarce, but that seemed easier to her than a meal. But he follows up with requesting lunch. And she recognizes him as a man of God because she makes an interesting statement. She said, as the Lord your God lives. Isn't that interesting? It's not her God. It will be. At this point, she's on the outside looking in, but God can move on anybody's heart anywhere to provide what his people need. And so she's gathering sticks. She say, why? To start a fire to bake the last morsel of food she's got for her and her son. Remember this, widows of all people were destitute. If a widow's family did not care for her, like Boaz cared for Naomi, for example, widows would struggle because they were the most vulnerable and poorest folk in that society. Why would God send Elijah to someone who was already in trouble, hoping that they would help him? Because in blessing Elijah... He will bless her and her family. You see, God is not just thinking about you and me, though he does. But God's heart is as big as the world. 25,000 miles in circumference. He wants to reach everybody. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What are you believing God for and who are you believing God for? And believe that God can reach the hardest case in your family history. Because he is a loving God, and he is reaching out to a widow and her son through a prophet who asks for lunch. It's amazing to me. Does God need our finances, folks? Or our time? Or our servants' service? Satan, remember when he tempted the Lord in the wilderness, said, turn these stones into bread. Could the Lord have done it? Of course he could have. It's not too hard for God. But he says to Satan, basically, that the bread of relationship with God is sustaining. What do I need to get through tough times and difficult times? <clears throat> I need him. He knows how to get the groceries to my house. And he knows how to get them to yours. And beyond that, he knows how to meet the other needs of our lives that sometimes are a lot bigger than that. If I've learned anything in being a pastor for 33 years is God does provide and God is a good God and he is near the brokenhearted and man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's where the sustenance, that's where the hope <clears throat> comes from. God could have sold a cattle on a thousand hills to meet Elijah's needs, but he decides to raise up a widow and her son and 
sight on 100 miles from the brook Cherith in enemy territory because God can make a table for you in the presence of your enemies. And he'll do something remarkable for you if you'll believe. It's a joy to support God's work. I love to give. Lauren, I love to give back to the church. I promise you. The tithe check is the easiest check she writes every month <clears throat> because God has given us so much. How could I withhold from the one who's given me everything I have ever had given to me? Sometimes in the inky morning darkness at our home, I get up with the chickens now. I'm turning into my dad, I tell you. I think I got up at 5.30 today. But in the darkness and the solitude and the quiet, reflective moments of intimacy with God and spending time in prayer and then reading his word. I'm just constantly reminded everywhere I look, every book, every chair, every plate, every beautiful painting hanging on a wall, it's all from his tender hand. And he has led me every step of my life since I committed my life to him as a teenager in North Carolina. So this story from 1 Kings is rich. And we need it during this pandemic. We need it when supply lines are being halted, when ships are docked away from port, when there's now a shortage of 80,000 truckers in the United States. Did you know that? Just three years ago, it was 60,000. Now it's 80,000. Now you're wondering, wow, well, how come I can't get stuff as fast as I used to? Because that lifeline has retired or are not working now are not able to work. The point is, is the world is fragile, but God isn't. The world has limitations, God doesn't. The world can't satisfy the longing of a human soul, but God can because he's the God that provides and he gave ultimate provision when he sent his son. Let me ask you a question, why are you here? Why are you watching? Because the same God who reached you has reached me. That's why I'm here. In his loving kindness, he extended a nail-scarred hand to me as a teenager in North Carolina and then called me to preach his word and how blessed I've been in the journey. I'm comforted that in, the, in between times, God really can take care of you because we're guided by the Lord, because we're provided for by the Lord. And do you see it? We are comforted by the Lord. Elijah says to her, and he needed to say this, and I promise you God is saying this to whatever is troubling you right at this moment. If it's too much month and not enough money, if it's an unkind boss, if it's a terrible marriage relationship, if it's an estranged child, if it's some other kind of heartache and disappointment, is God is saying to you through Elijah, do not fear. Go and do as you've said, be, but first make me a little cake, he says. Go ahead, prepare the meal, but before you even feed yourself or your boy, bring me something to eat. Prioritize serving the Lord first, and the Lord's anointed. And so, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug shall not be empty until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth. Did you hear that promise tucked away there? This is a lady. <clears throat> doesn't even know the Lord. But she's about to have her faith and her whole life restarted. It's a new beginning for her and her boy. And the promise here, and remember the drought will last three years. The promise is because you've listened to God, because you met my need for water, and soon we'll meet my need for lunch. And I'll stay with you for, and your boy for a time. But even after I leave, even after God relocates me, the jar of oil that you think's about empty will never run dry till the drought ends, till the famine ends. What a promise. Here it's the promise of sustenance. It's the promise of hope. It's the promise of provision. Even all around you, everything's falling apart. I will take care of you, God is saying, through the prophet to this lady, ultimately to her son. And 3,000 years later, he's saying to you and I, 
plunged in the midst of a pandemic that has put the world on tilt. I know where you are, and I know what I'll do to take care of you. That's the promise of the text. And it is so rich. And can I tell you, it is so comforting today. The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth, until the drought's over, lady, let me tell you something. God's going to stock your cupboards. You're going to have oil and flour. Oil and flour. Your boy will never look up and say, why can't we eat today? Because when a life is reorientated into the stream of God's provision, provision never ends. He has a faith that might be seen as insanity. He speaks to the widow, famous words that God is forever speaking to us. <clears throat> Do not fear. 365 times in the word of God, in all 66 books, you'll find uh, some reference to not being afraid. 365 times you'll find it in the Bible. Don't be afraid. Don't fear. Fear not. <clears throat> and maybe you need to hear that word today. Fear not. Trust God. Obey God. And God will go with you and work with you. She prepares what she must have thought was the last supper for them all. And then to wake up the next day and there's more oil and more flour. Because God's compassionate provision has arrived at last. When it comes time for the next meal, there's still something in the jar. Likewise for the next meal. And the next, and the next. The jar never runs out. This destitute woman let go and gave everything to God for his use to meet a need of a prophet. And does that surprise us? Does it really? That God took care of her, God provided. Will God do that for you? If you trust God, I believe you will. As you look down through the text, and 1 Kings 17 is so rich, you'll find that after the provision and after the food, her son dies. And she is so troubled and in such derision and such agony and such desperation. And Elijah goes up to where the boy is and prays for him three times. And then God brings him back to life. It's a story that parallels Jesus resurrecting a, a young girl that had died. And he brings her back to life and presents her to her family. Can you imagine the joy in that little place in Sidon? Can you imagine, even though all around the neighborhood there's despair and fear and trepidation, in that little place where Elijah has laid his head, there is the joy of God. And folks, I can't tell you this strong enough, but when you really focus on the Lord, when you entrust your life to him with a totality of life and thought, in that exchange, there will become a peace to you. Jesus promised in the 14th chapter of the book of John, my peace I give to you, not as the world do I give it unto you, but it's my peace. That's what he offers you. One writer said there's five important lessons for us to learn from this today quickly. We cannot control the world, so we're better off to let go of our plans and lean into God's purpose in this changing world. We can't change it, but He can. Number two, God's plan for us involves time, sometimes alone in the desert, and time together serving Him and serving others. Sometimes the Lord will take you to a place of solitude and rest and a place to think. A brook cherith, but you can't linger, linger there. God will move you to a new opportunity. God wants us to ask what we need in prayer. We have not because we ask not. Ask that your joy might be full. Listen to me, folks. Prayer won't get you everything you want, but prayer will get you everything God wants you to have. Pray and receive, doubt, and do without. Compassion, not control, fourth lesson, is the key to living in this world. It's not holding on to our little jar of oil or our little jar of flour. It's saying, is there a need? Then I will help every way I can. 
That's why I commend you so much on, on stepping out and helping the church during a little tight time financially. You've responded with, with uh, grace and generosity. That's what God's people do. We don't ignore a need. If we can do something, we do it. We're only going to pass through this life once. Let's don't hold back when we can help out. And then finally, God's ways sometimes don't make sense to us in our minds or the mind of the world. But vibrant faith involves walking on the unknown, illogical path with God and observing God working through us and among us. Remember, folks, the other side of risk is sometimes it really works out. <laughs> Just cast your bread upon the water and watch what he'll do. Thank God for this widow in Zarephath. Thank God for Elijah's need because God connected them and her boy and in that time of famine and drought, there was joy in Zarephath because a widow found out that the God of Elijah could become hers too. And one day I anticipate meeting her and her son and maybe she'll bake us some bread for old time's sake. Father, I thank you for the truth of this passage for anyone watching who has not given their heart to Jesus, I pray they would. They would confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead, and ask you to come into their life. For others who are watching, and they've got some real challenges that they're facing, I pray they would feel your comfort and peace. And thank you that you're planning the exit strategy for them. Just because they can't see it doesn't mean it's not in process. And thank you for the reminder today <clears throat> that God really can take care of us in the in-between places, when we're in an isolated place like the Brook Cherith, or when we're making our way through enemy territory to Zarephath. Everywhere and in between, the steps of a good man and a good Lord, or a good woman, are directed by the Lord, and he delighteth in their way. Thank you for that. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But God delivers us from them all. Thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Pastor Mark Hensley here from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church, Colorado Springs, hoping you have a restful afternoon. And remember, if God be for you, who can be against you? Have a good afternoon, folks.